Good morning and welcome to our service this morning from Viewfield Baptist Church. It's really good to have this opportunity to meet together this morning as we come in worship and as we share in the Word. If you're a visitor for the first time this morning and would like to know a little more about us, please take time to have a look at our website and you can also contact us by calling the church office or by using the online contact form. The online bulletin contains details about our services and other events, but I'll just highlight the main ones for you. Our quiz night will be on Thursday, uh, Thursday evening at 8pm as usual, and our service next Sunday uh, will be again at 10.30. Now there's a change to our midweek prayer meeting this week. We're taking the opportunity under the relaxation of lockdown rules to meet together uh, in the sanctuary for a time of prayer. And Bible study. If you're on the email distribution list uh, then you should have already received information about this uh, together with the procedures that we're putting in place to meet the current guidelines. The service will start at 7.30 but we would ask that uh, you do not start to arrive until uh, 7.15 unless you are part of the setup team. Access uh, will be via the main doors from the car park uh, and we'll also need to know uh, who is planning to attend. Uh, so you'll need to register your intention in advance by either calling the office or by emailing the office uh, by midday uh, tomorrow. That's Monday the 17th of August. Now this is a trial meeting, so please bear with us as we try and work through these uh, government guidance uh, together. Uh, if you're not able to attend in person, then uh, don't worry. Uh, we will also be uh, having a, uh, a pre-recorded online prayer meeting, which will go out at the usual time of 7.30. Now, in Isaiah 42, we read this. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. In a moment we're going to sing, but before we do that, let's commit ourselves in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to meet together. May our worship sing out to you in praise this morning, and may your word be opened up to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shazam! 
the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. feel 
And then we looked at the Bible and we saw what Jesus said. He said that his power is strongest when we feel weak. And that was a great thing to remember. I also talked about Paul. Remember Paul? He was one of Jesus' followers and he was going round to different towns and different cities to tell people all about Jesus. But quite often he felt weak because people didn't always want or like what he said and quite often he found himself in prison. And while he was in prison, he would have been guarded by soldiers. And he would have spent a lot of time with soldiers, maybe studied them, even talked to them. And perhaps this was the inspiration for the time in the Bible he told us about the armour of God. And I'm going to read you now the bit in the Bible it comes from. It comes from Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read from verse 14. And it says, So stand ready with the truth as a belt tight around your waist, with righteousness as your breastplate, and as your shoes the readiness to announce the good news of peace. At all times carry faith as a shield, for with you it will be able to put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one, and accept salvation as a helmet, and the word of God as the sword which the Spirit gives you. Do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Well, Paul wrote these words as encouragement for people. And I bet you're thinking, what does it all actually mean? This is the kind of time where you wish there was perhaps a Roman soldier around nowadays to help us with that. Oh, hello. Uh, uh, what's your name? Tiberius. Oh, um, hello Tiberius. Uh, pleased to meet you. I'm uh, Jill, Jill, Jillianus. Very pleased to meet you. Uh, I was wondering if you might be able to help us uh, and talk us through your armour so we can understand this passage. I'll do my best. Oh, great. Uh, what about starting with your belt? This belt is important because it holds my clothes out of the way when I'm going into battle and it helps fix the breastplate in place, which is important. Well, uh, I'm glad you said that because Paul talks about it as the belt of truth. And we know that Jesus is the truth in this world. So if we trust Jesus and put him, him at the centre of everything that we think, say or do, then they'll act like the belt and hold everything together. Can you tell us about this now? This is my breastplate. This protects the important parts of my body like the heart and the lungs. Without this, uh, I'd be... Uh, uh, open to the advance of the enemy and I might not be here to speak to you today. Oh dear Tiberius, well Paul goes on to talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness is a big word but basically it means being right in God's eyes. So if we learn to read our Bible regularly and obey what's written in it, we are being righteous in God's eyes. And when we're righteous in God's eyes, he will help us to make the right choices when we're tempted to do the things that take us away from him. So thank you, Tiberius. Could you tell us now about your sandals? They don't look as if they're going to do very much in battle. Well, they might not look like very much, but if you think about it, if I was to go into battle without these, my feet would get all sore and cut and bruised and I wouldn't be ready for the, for the fray. Oh, I think I'm beginning to understand. Paul talks about the shoes being shoes of the gospel of peace. And gospel means good news. And we know that the good news is that Jesus was sent to die for our sins and that we'd have eternal life. And when, when we know about this, we get a sense of peace. And that sense of peace helps us to be ready to tell other people the good news. Right. Uh, what about this rather magnificent shield here, Tiberius? This Tiberius? is my shield. This protects me from the arrows of the enemy as they come overhead. And uh, I can also use it as a sort of ram. As I move forward, I can push into people, perhaps knock the enemy over a bit. Oh, very handy, Tiberius. Well, this, uh, Paul refers to this as the shield of faith. And it says in the Bible to take up our shield of faith to put out the flaming arrows from the enemy. And that was a bit like last week, 
Remember when I was getting the paper arrows thrown at me and I had to try and stop them? And these arrows said not nice things like people were talking behind my back or were tempting me to cheat uh, for my training. And we need something to stop this. But faith is more than a feeling. Faith is the belief that Jesus created the world, that the world went bad and he sent his son Jesus to save us from our sins and to have eternal life. And that is the belief. And when we really believe that, that becomes a shield to help stop all these thoughts, to help stop all these things that are coming in from round about in the world. Now, Tiberius, what have we got left to tell us about? Oh, what about that magnificent helmet on your head? You like it, do I you? I do it's, like it, Tiberius. This system is my, my rank, uh, is a, a, I ah. evidence by this helmet, but it protects my head. You see, if my head was unprotected and, and I was hit during the battle, then the rest of the armour wouldn't be worthwhile. It would be a waste of time. Wow, Tiberius. I, for a moment I thought that was tinsel on your head, but oh no. Uh, Paul refers to the helmet of salvation. Now, salvation is another big word, but salvation is sort of like not getting punished for the things you do wrong. So, so if we come to God and tell him all our sins, and we're sorry for them, he will forgive us, and that will give us uh, peace of heart and our mind, uh, and that's like the protection of the helmet. Uh, Tiberius, have you got anything else to show us? My sword. Wow. Not very big, it's quite sharp, but it's very sharp, and it's very pointed, and it allows me to take the battle to the enemy. Ah, well that's interesting, because Paul talks about the sword of the spirit. And we know that the sword of the Spirit is God's Word. And God's Word is basically everything written in the Bible. In fact, in the Bible, it says that God's Word is sharper than a double-edged sword. And that's brilliant to know because that helps us when it, we're tempted by the things of the world to judge what is right and wrong. And it also helps to keep us alive to tell other people about the good news too. Well, thank you so much, Tiberius. It's been a pleasure having you today and, and such a help to try and teach us a little about, about the importance of wearing the whole armour of God and how that can really protect us from the things in the world that get in the way of helping us love God and making us feel weak. So I feel a lot stronger after I've met you, Tiberius. Uh, where are you off to? Are you off to battle now? No, I'm off to the supermarket, but that's the same thing. Oh, well, thank you, Tiberius. And thank you, everyone.
virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection. Good morning, everyone. It's really nice to join you today and to lead you in some prayers for our world and for um, all the people who are having difficulties just now and sharing different joys as well. I would invite you now to, to join me in prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this world that you have given to us. We thank you for all the challenges and all the joys that we're facing just now. And we pray for those who are having difficulties because of the COVID pandemic. We thank you, Lord, for the agencies who are trying to help and for the governments who are doing really good things to try and contain the, the virus. But we pray for those around the world who are struggling because they've lost loved ones and because they are in difficult situations financially and socially. We ask, Lord, that you would intervene and that you would bring this pandemic to an end so that we can get back to some sort of normality again. We also pray for the situation in Beirut, knowing, Lord, that there are some terrible challenges there too. We pray for those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those who are struggling to um, find justice in that situation. And we pray for the authorities, Lord, that they would realise their accountability and that, again, there would be peace in that area. We thank you, Lord, for the Port St Mary Beach Mission. We thank you for the way that it's been possible for it to go on virtually and with some events on the island. And we thank you, Lord, that that has come about and that uh, the technical skills of the team have meant that that is possible. We pray for all the children and young people who've been involved in this and we pray that they would hear the gospel clearly and be able to see um, something of you in the team, although they're not able to meet all of them. We pray for the team that you would be with them and encourage them in these days as well. We thank you too for Discipleship Explored having started last Sunday. Um, we pray for those who are involved with that and we ask Lord that they would have known your presence with them and again this coming week and that it would be a real encouragement to them and help them to grow in their faith. We bring to those within our fellowship who have been bereaved, who are struggling with the loss of a loved one. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would comfort them and be with them in these days. We also pray, Father, for those who are struggling in, in their mental health just now, particularly with um, the COVID-19 situation. And we pray, Father, that you would draw alongside them and be with them also at this moment. We pray for those who are in physical ill health too, and pray, Father, that you would heal them and help them to know a measure of, of strength and health again. That they would know something more of yourself as you are working in their lives. And we pray for those who are having relationship difficulties just now. And pray, Father, that you would also help them to resolve this, to 
uh, bring forgiveness where it is needed and reconciliation between people. We thank you too for uh, the moving forward that is possible at the moment and we pray for the, the meeting which will happen on Wednesday that everything would go well and that the leadership would be um, able to know what to do in these situations and in others when things begin to open up again. We thank you for the leadership of our church and we ask your blessing on them and your enabling and, and your help for them, uh, that you would give them wisdom in these days as we are in such extraordinary circumstances. And we bring all these things to you and pray our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read God's word together now as well. And um, it's again the story of Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 um, that we read last time. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the, the story today um, as our pastor leads us. So let's read this together. Now for some time a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Simon had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them, come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritans' towns. This is the Lord's word to us today. There's a story told about a little boy who at the end of a church service ran to the front and stood at the pulpit and shouted into the microphone, Hey, everyone, look at me! Look at me! Everyone, look at me! And one elderly lady in the congregation turned to her friend and said, That's just like his dad every Sunday. The little boy's dad was the minister and the lady clearly thought that the minister liked the stage a little bit too much, that maybe he had a, a bigger ego than he should have and had an issue with pride. Proverbs 16 verse 19 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Throughout the Bible we see examples of the danger of pride. You know, pride was the reason that Satan fell from heaven. Satan began to become more occupied with his own splendor and beauty, according to Ezekiel 
28 and it was his lofty thoughts about himself that led to his expulsion from heaven. Isaiah's account of his fall makes it clear that it was because of pride. Satan speaking said this, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Pride was the reason that Satan fell from heaven. But pride was also the reason for the fall of Adam and Eve. We're told this in Genesis 3 verses 1 to 5. They sought to be like God and to to eat from the tree they were told not to eat from, to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was pride that blinded their hearts and their eyes as they listened to the voice of Satan and ate of the forbidden fruit. And by the sins of pride and rebellion, they threw the whole human race into chaos. You know, pride was also the reason for the fall of King Saul. He made a lot of terrible decisions, but he was more concerned so often about what people thought rather than what God thought. He had a fear of man rather than a fear of God. He had uh, insecurity and he definitely struggled with pride. We see an example of this in 1 Samuel 15 verse 30. Saul, he couldn't bring himself to repent and deal with his disobedience. Right before stating that he had sinned, he asked Samuel to honour him before the elders of his people. Pride was the reason for King Saul's downfall. You know, pride was the reason as well why the disciples argued about who was the greatest in Mark chapter 9. Let me just read some verses there as the disciples have an argument about who was the greatest. Mark 9 verse 33, Then they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. You know, in leadership teams across the country, there are times when people jostle for power. It might not be as blatantly obvious as a as a a spoken argument about who is the greatest, but but people like power. But we are called by the Lord Jesus Himself, following His example as leaders and as Christians, to take on the nature of a servant, to be a servant. To serve others, to humble ourselves, as Jesus went on to, to say, as he illustrated by picking up a child. You know, pride was the reason why the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. You know, sadly, all too often, pride within the lives of believers has led to disunity, has led to division in local churches, uh, in the church, because people want their own way. And as we've said many times, that down through the centuries, we see more harm done to the church by division within than by opposition out with. (coughs) You know, the middle letter in the word pride is the letter I. And the middle letter in the word sin is the letter I as well. You know, self is at the heart of pride. I must have. I must have pleasure. I must have my way. I must have everything my heart desires, no matter what it costs me or what it costs others. And friends, this was one of Simon the Sorcerer's greatest problems, pride. As we said last week, he had a wrong view of himself. He saw himself as someone who was great. He boasted that he was someone great, as we're told in Acts 8, 
verse 9. He had a big ego and he thought too highly of himself, but he had a great influence as well. And sadly, he was leading many others astray, as we're told in Acts 8, verses 10 to 11. <coughs> and as I said last week as well, I believe that he was one of the first tears sown into the early church by the devil. It's a basic principle in scripture that wherever God sows his true believers, the devil will eventually sow his counterfeits, as we're told in Matthew chapter 13. And we need to remember that we are in a spiritual battle. We need to put on the full armor of God. We need to stand firm against the attacks of the evil one. Satan is a clear and a present enemy and he wants to steal, kill and destroy. He wants to hold back the work of the kingdom of God and when God is on the move, the devil is active. God is on the move at Viewfield and we need to pray for protection upon our church and upon our church family and pray that God would, would watch over us, that God would continue to, to fight for us as we move forward in faith and in victory. So it's no surprise here in Acts chapter 8 that when God is at work, when the church is growing, the devil is active through a man named Simon the sorcerer. Simon appeared to be a genuine believer, even one as discerning as Philip accepted him at his word and baptized him. Just shows how hard it is to discern between the wheat and the tares. It was not until Simon tried to buy the authority and power of the Holy Spirit that he was unmasked. So where did Simon go wrong? We reflected last week that he had a wrong view of self and this morning I want to just consider that he had a wrong view of salvation. He had a wrong view of salvation. We're told in Acts chapter 8 that through the ministry of, of Philip and others, a revival had broken out in Samaria. God was at work. People were trusting in the Lord Jesus. People were being baptized and added to the fellowship as Philip preached the gospel. Let me read verse 12 of Acts chapter 8. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and and woman. God was at work and people's lives were being changed and let me tell you today that as the gospel is shared, as the gospel is preached, men and women's lives can be transformed, they can be completely changed. Maybe you're praying for a, a family member or a friend, you're praying that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to be um, persevering in those prayers to not give up to keep praying because God is able our God is able salvation belongs to our God and Jesus is the only hope he's the only hope for our lives he's the only hope for every life he's the only way to to God the Father John 14 verse 6 Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life. No one can come to God the Father except through me. So Philip was sharing the gospel in the power of the Spirit. And every one of us are called to be his witnesses. Jesus said as well in Matthew 28, the end of the, the chapter and at the end of that gospel, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of every nation baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything i have commanded you and surely i am with you always even to the end of the age what a great thought the beginning of those words that i just quoted Jesus says that we go in his authority, in the authority of his name. 
And at the end, he says that he will be with us. And we know that the, the promised Holy Spirit has come and that God is with us. God lives within us to help us to, to pray in the Spirit, to help us to, to witness in the Spirit, to help us to take opportunities for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are not to be afraid. We're not to be ashamed. We're told in Romans 1 verse 16, don't be ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. It's a great chorus from many years ago from the acetate age, from the age of rainbow guitar straps when praise leaders led. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. A revival was breaking out here in Acts chapter 8 and Philip was preaching the gospel, the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, we're told, verse 12. You know, Jesus himself, when he begun his ministry, declared in Mark 1, verse 15, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. No doubt most of the Jews read political revolution into the phrase kingdom of God, but that is not what Jesus had in mind at all. His kingdom has to do with his reign in the lives of his people. It's a spiritual realm and not a political organization. The only way to enter God's kingdom is through believing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and being born again by the Spirit of God. So Philip preached. Christ, And we are called to preach Christ. To preach Christ and him crucified. To share the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus. Acts 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in his name. There is no other name under heaven by which the men and women can be saved other than than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are fearful in these days in our world for many different reasons. People are looking for hope and looking in all sorts of different places, but Jesus, the perfect Prince of Peace, can be their living hope. He is the only hope for the world. And as we reflect upon the Gospel, as we think about the good news of Jesus. We, we think about his virgin birth. We're told about that in Matthew 1 verse 20. His sinless life. Hebrews 7 verse 26. His authoritative teaching. Matthew 7 verse 29. His atoning death. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. His bodily Resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, his glorious ascension, Acts 1, verses 9 to 10, his present intercession, Hebrews 1, verse 3, and his promised return, Acts 1, verse 11. He is willing and able to save all who come to God by him and through him. Salvation belongs to our God. This is good news. How can we not tell this story? How can people hear unless we tell them? How beautiful are the feet that bring good news? How beautiful are the feet that bring good news? I remember years ago going to hear a guy, I think his name was Steve Connor, he used to work with a, a Christians in Sport organization in Scotland and um, he shared his testimony and, and spoke about how he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also spoke about times when he had the opportunity to lead others to faith. And he held up a, <coughs> a shoe. It was kind of plated. It was like a, a trophy, almost like a sports trophy. And on it, it was just a word of thanks to Steve. Thanks for sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it had that verse, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news. Someone had given Steve this trophy to basically say, thank you for telling me. 
Thank you for sharing the good news. It's changed my life. It's transformed my life. I was brought up in Edinburgh, old Ricky, and um, when I was young, often at the weekends, we would go up to Princess Street, and then as a teenager, I would go up by myself and buy some CDs when you did buy CDs or computer games or, or something. And I remember walking along Princess Street, and there would be these little red boxes, and there would be a normally a man who would be shouting out, you know, read all about it, read all about it, get your evening news, your Edinburgh evening news. And on a Saturday, they used to uh, sell what was called the pink paper, which was the sports paper. And, and they would shout out, read all about it, read all about it, get your Edinburgh evening news. Well, friends, we need to point people to the Word of God and to Jesus. The Word made flesh who dwelt among us. Read all about it. Read the stories. Start in John if you're not a Christian. I encourage you today. Read the Gospel of John. Read about Jesus. The one who is the way, the truth and the life. The one who can save your very soul. The one who can bring hope and peace and joy for this life and for the next. I urge you to read all about it. We need to point people to the word of God and to the God of the word. You know, this was the, the message that Philip preached, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we read on in Acts chapter 8, we see the response of the people to the message. And we're told that people believed, that they were baptised, um, that they were added to the fellowship. God was working. Jesus was working by his spirit, transforming people's lives. And you know, friends, we need to remember that as we seek to live for Jesus and share our faith, we never labor in vain for the gospel, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. We may not always see the fruit, but God is at work. God will use your obedience for his glory and a passage that often gives me peace as I reflect on sharing the word of God or sowing the seed is the parable of the sower that, that Jesus told and really our responsibility is to to sow the seed and to leave the results to God and we see different responses really of the human heart illustrated in and how the seed fares when it lands on the ground. Let me read just some verses from Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. And first of all, verses 3 to 8. Matthew 13, verses 3 to 8. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, but it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was so. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then on to verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, 
or 30 times what was so wow wow our responsibility is to sow the seed to sow the seed are we doing that? are we sowing the seed are we sharing the gospel and leaving the results to God here Philip is Philip is faithful in his calling he is preaching the gospel as we're told in Acts 8 verse 12 and many men and women believed and were baptized people's lives were tr transformed as they they trusted in Jesus and we long to see more people following Jesus here in Dunfermline praise God there are in recent days been a number who've put their faith in Jesus and we have people who are waiting to be baptized and people who are waiting to come into membership of Viewfield Baptist of our family and we just are thankful to God for how he's been growing the church but we long for more people to follow Jesus for more people to choose to put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to pray and be faithful in sowing the seed but desire that God would really move and that God would touch hearts and open eyes as the story goes on we're told that Simon the sorcerer professes faith and he is baptized and follows on after Philip look at verse 13 of chapter 8 Simon himself believed and was baptized and he followed Philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw however as I suggested earlier it appears that he wasn't a true believer indeed most commentators argue that he was a tear sown by the devil into the church and Simon showed his true heart when he tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit and Peter actually rebukes him by what he says in verses 20 to 21 Peter answered may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money you have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God Peter rebuked him Peter challenged him with those words it appears that Simon's motives were wrong as more people believed as more people followed the Lord Jesus Simon saw his following dwindle his declining popularity and a desire to be associated with the the God of the Messiah and a desire to learn what he perceived to be Philip's power motivated him to profess Christ and after he was baptized he continued on with Philip for three reasons I believe he wanted to sustain contact with the people following the preacher by joining Philip he went where the action was and kept his influence alive secondly he witnessed amazing miracles and power and he wanted to find out more and thirdly as his later conduct shows he wanted to acquire the power for himself he wanted to buy that power his motives were wrong he had a wrong view of salvation you know true conversion has to do with the heart and not just the head Simon may have believed with his head but he didn't believe in his heart for him salvation was more about the external rather than the internal and this is a clear difference faith that does not transform a life is not saving faith let me read some words from James chapter 2 that just illustrate this point James 2 and I want to read first of all verse 14 what good is it my brothers if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save him and then verses 17 
to 19. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Oh, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You know, Simon may have had some belief in his head, but it appears that his heart had not been transformed. You know, even the demons believe in God, but are not saved. Faith that does not transform a life is not saving faith. True conversion has to do with the heart, not only with the head. This point is made clearly in Romans 10 verses 9 to 10. Believing isn't enough. You have to make a commitment from your heart to enter into a relationship with God. There's a great illustration about this, um, about Blondin, who was a, a tightrope walker from many, many years ago. He was an amazing man. And um, on one particular day, he was planning to tightrope walk across the Niagara Falls and the rope was in place. Crowds were there of people wanting to watch him and he did many tricks as he walked across doing various different things, juggling etc. on some of his walks and he would say to the crowd, do you believe that I could take someone across this tightrope inside a wheelbarrow and he was crying this out to the crowds on one particular occasion and um, first of all when he said that people would say yes we believe we believe you can do that and then he would say okay who wants to get in and there wasn't so many who were willing to to get in the wheelbarrow you know it's one thing to say I believe it's another thing to to commit, to commit. And to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is to confess with your mouth, to believe in your heart, and to commit your life to Christ. Saving faith will transform your life. It'll not be perfect, but it will make a difference in your life. So as we draw to a close this morning, I want to bring a challenge to you. If you're not a Christian today, you know, Jesus is the only way to God. He is the bridge between you and God and a, a home in heaven. Put your faith in Christ. Today can be the day of salvation for you. To find forgiveness for your sin. To find peace with God peace of soul to find joy to find hope for tomorrow and for all your tomorrows even beyond this life choose life choose Jesus just as we finish we come back to that story about the disciples arguing about who was the greatest well Jesus responds is to make it clear that it's only the humble who are fit to enter the kingdom of God. Unless we humble ourselves like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's the poor in spirit and not the proud in heart who experience saving faith. Friends, let's have a confidence in Jesus and a confidence in the gospel. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. And let's seek to pray strategically for friends, for family, for work colleagues and seek to take opportunities to, to speak about the Lord Jesus. And let's move forward with expectation that our God is able, more than able. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge of your word, for the power of your word. And we just pray, Lord God, that by your spirit you would stir our hearts. Help us to be humble. 
Help us to be bold in our witness for you. And Lord, I pray even as a result of this message today that some would seek to be more strategic in their, their witnessing and that people would come to faith because of that. Lord, send home the prodigals. Lord, open the eyes of the blind. Give us a harvest of souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's respond to God's word together as we prepare our hearts to share communion. again to share this meal together. We really long for the day when we're back together in person and being able to, to share this meal as a local church family but it's great that we can continue to connect at the same time in this way um, by sharing fellowship even over these virtual means because we love one another and we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we are the body of Christ. We are family and as we come to read some words of scripture and to eat bread and, and drink wine we remember the Lord Jesus the head of the body but we also do it remembering one another and uh, we do it as family, as community, as we journey together as believers. You know God is so good God loves us. God has made a way for us um, through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've spoken a lot today about uh, the gospel and salvation and praise God salvation belongs to him and that in Christ we are saved, we are right with God, we are forgiven, we are justified just as if we have never sinned and that God by his spirit lives within us. We are children of God and we can cry out, Abba, Father, nothing can separate us from God. 
through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read some words from Ephesians chapter 2, speaking about being made alive in Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray and give thanks for the bread and the wine. God, we thank you that we celebrate good news today. Good news that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Good news that the Lord Jesus was willing to humble himself even unto death on the cross. Good news that through his shed blood we are forgiven of all our sins. Good news that because he died, a way has been made right into the holy place. That the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Good news even now as we share this meal that we know that on the third day he rose from the dead and then ascended back to heaven and he reigns and one day he is coming back. He is our saviour. Salvation belongs to our God and we just want to give thanks for the, the death of Christ. As we eat bread we want to give thanks for his broken body given for us. As we drink the cup we want to give thanks for his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night you will be betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. Eat the bread now and remember the body of Christ given for you. In the same way after supper the Lord Jesus took the cup and he said this cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink this do so in remembrance of me. Let's drink together as a sign of our unity in Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you.
Let's pray. God, we just really thank you for this time together. We're just so thankful for who you are, for what you've done for us in Christ, and for how you bless us, and how you lead us, and how you provide for us, and how you help us. God, our lives are in your hands. We thank you that you are a God who is a strong tower, a place of refuge, that we can know protection and safety in you. And Lord, quite simply, we trust in you. We trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not on our understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you. And we know that you will keep our path straight. Help us to look to God, to look to him, to look for his word and for his voice, to be led by him, to be obedient to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Um, thanks again for connecting with us. We look forward to connecting again soon. Have a great day and be assured of my prayers for you. See you soon.